So, there are different types of book collectors, right? There's ones that buy and read them every once in a while, and there's the full-on librarians that either have the time and the space to cater to their obsession, or they end up on hoarders. Somewhere in between are the folks that went digital. God bless them. And then there's purgers like me, always having to decide what to get rid of to avoid ending up on hoarders. During my last purge, I came across my old Hellraiser trades, which I hadn't read in years. And the weird thing is, I had forgotten how they were actually some of the best horror comics I'd ever read. After flipping through them a little bit, it occurred to me that most people probably have no idea these even exist. So they make a perfect subject for another video. They're super under the radar, but they're still related to something most people know at least a little bit about, and they're really, really good. Before diving into the comics, let's explore. What the hell is Hellraiser? It's good stuff. Well, upon deciding to do a Hellraiser project, I did a little digging to see what Hellraiser actually encompasses. Like many other movies, Hellraiser was based on a book, this one being a horror novella called The Hellbound Heart by Clive Barker. You know, that award-winning famous guy known for being a master horror writer. Seeing that he was the one who created Hellraiser was an intriguing reason to get into this franchise. I knew there were some movies from the late 80s, early 90s, but boy was I in for a shock. There are actually nine movies in the Hellraiser series. Nine! Why? A lot, a lot Why? Of Why? What? Not seven, not six, not twelve. Twelve's a lot. Nine. Nine? Nine. 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 There's nine. As ridiculous as it seemed, I couldn't help but feel the gravity of that ridiculous number. The number nine dragged me down to the depths of this fucking franchise. I had to watch them all. I convinced my friend, the editor of these videos, to join me in this stupid crusade. Notice I said stupid, because now I know it was a bad idea. A lot of our friendship in college was forged watching horror movies. Those were good times. We were sort of the last generation to really appreciate video stores, which were great, because often you pick stuff based on the cover art. No reviews, no five-star rating system. Sometimes you end up discovering something wonderful. A movie like Session 9. That's just one movie, not nine movies. There's nine sessions, it's just one movie. This is a really good movie, by the way. There's no Blu-ray of this or anything like that. I'm the only one who loves this movie, but it's an outstanding horror movie. You should seek it out. Anyway, sometimes you get something wonderful, and sometimes you get Cracker Jacked, which has the distinguished honor of being the only video we ever watched less than 30 minutes of before getting back in the car, driving all the way back to the store, and begging the clerk to let us get something else, only to have the clerk say, Yeah, dude, you're not the first. I knew what you were getting into, but I didn't want to be rude. So yeah, it had been a while since we marathoned some true blue horror shit, but it would be just like old times. We thought we had a pretty good idea of what we'd be getting ourselves into. These movies. What do I have to say about these movies? Oh man, we watch all of these fucking movies. All nine of them. Nine, nine movies. Nine, 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 nine. Oh, yes, 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 yes. That is 16 hours of Hellraiser. And while 16 hours of being ripped apart in cool BDSM leather outfits sounds maybe appealing, it's actually a whole lot of this. And us discussing all those movies and that walking, that's another topic and another video. And podcasts, listen to our podcast, which we did. Seriously, we actually did a three hour podcast about it all. Link in the description. But between all that walking and looking, there were a lot of series mainstays like Number one, Lament Configurations. These puzzle box things that open gateways for this dude named Pinhead. Number two, Pinhead and his merry band of Cenobites. We got a fat guy with sunglasses Cenobite. Cold teeth chattering, I need a sweater Cenobite. Or maybe it gets a little too close for comfort. CD Cenobite, and even this guy with a dick on top of his head. Seriously, if anything from Hellraiser has staying power in pop culture, it's Pinhead. He's easily one of the most revered horror icons post Universal Monsters. Shit. He's on every single movie poster on the franchise, even if he's barely in the film. What we're looking at here is a fan-made brawler video game with all the horror icons duking it out with each other. You got your Freddy, you got your Jason right there, you got your Pumpkinhead, I guess, and uh, right here you got Pinhead. It just goes to show when people think of the most iconic horror bad guys, Pinhead's included in the conversation. If you mention the word Hellraiser to someone, the first thing they'll probably think of is Pinhead. So they got something right there. Moving on. Number three, more chains than a Mr. T birthday party. Pinhead pity no fools. You also see some familiar faces, like 
Adam Scott from Parks and Rec, <laughs> having repeated sex with a demon for 200 years. It's about what I want. I forget. You like it rough, don't you? That's some good... And who the fuck was that? Yeah, that's goddamn Superman, getting a blowjob. Here's a lesson, kids. You can star in a low-budget horror movie, straight to video, and still one day become the fucking Man of Steel. Straight to video horror, to superhero. I just blow my fans. But best of all, this guy right here, who went on to be JP Money in Ping Pong Playa, the greatest movie ever made. Anyone who can eat a Cinnabon with their bare hands like this is a certified badass. I swear to God, I'm going to have to kill somebody. Oh right, and this guy from the Allstate Insurance commercials. Let's open the fucking box. Overall, there was good, and there was bad, and there was really bad. Watching enough of these people open these fucking boxes kind of makes me feel like I've opened one of my own. Made me feel like this. <laughs> Wait, Danny O'Dwyer, come back! We're here to talk about the Hellraiser comics. Seriously, I'm here to tell you that the Hellraiser comics from the 90s are actually the best thing to come out of the franchise. Mainly because they don't really have anything to do with the movies at all. Pinhead makes very rare appearances. The puzzle boxes are sometimes abstracted to the point of being crossword puzzles, for example, or a game of Russian roulette. They have a lot of the same themes, but they explore them in radically different and unique ways. In my opinion, they're some of the best anthology-style horror comics around. They're right there with Tales from the Crypt, and there's a perfectly reasonable explanation. The beginning of that explanation goes all the way back to 1977 and the launch of Heavy Metal magazine. Heavy Metal was a US rebranding of a European sci-fi fantasy comic magazine called Metal Hurlant, which started just a few years prior. Heavy Metal distinguished itself by having more mature, often dark and erotic stories, and showcased some of the best comic artwork put to page. Just to give you an idea, 300 Watchmen and Man of Steel director Zack Snyder grew up on Heavy Metal magazine. He said the first time he picked up a popular superhero comic, his first question was, when are they going to start having sex with each other and start killing? For some people, that probably explains a lot. You see, at this point in American history, there was something called the Comics Code Authority. This was a self-censoring body that was regulating the content of comic books. It essentially gentrified comic books to the point that Batman and Superman were playing softball together instead of gouging out the Joker's eye with a batarang. To tell more mature stories and get around the code, some companies publish their comics in a magazine format. The differences are arbitrary, but just big enough to be able to get around the code on a technicality. Marvel saw heavy metal influencing a generation and launched their own competing comic magazine called Epic Illustrated in 1980, and a comic sub-imprint two years later called Epic Comics. Epic Comics stood apart from DC and Marvel by having creator-owned content resulting in great stuff like Dreadstar, Alien Legion, Starstruck, Moonshadow, and Martial Law. It was a valiant effort to showcase original stories by creators with real personal vested interest in the content. But low sales eventually led Marvel to start using Epic Comics as the imprint for mature stories featuring Marvel characters like Elektra and Silver Surfer. They were also responsible for debuting foreign classics like The Inkle and Akira. Epic straight up pooped out in 1994, but they helped set a precedent for future mature imprints and publishers like Vertigo and Image. Also during that fertile, mature-driven creative period, Epic Comics picked up the license for an exciting new horror movie franchise called Hellraiser. The Epic Hellraiser comics ran 20 issues between 1989 and 1992. They were published in an anthology-style format, so each issue contained several short stories. This put it in the same company as other horror anthology-style comics like Tales from the Crypt and 60s horror magazines like Creepy, Eerie, and Vampirella. The whole thing was supervised by Clive Barker himself, and lots of prominent comic book creators contributed, including Alex Ross, Mike Mignola, and Neil Gaiman. If there was any editorial mandate to keep the stories Hellraiser-related, it was very loose. Okay, with all that out of the way, let's take a closer look at the comics themselves and what I consider to be some of the best stories. They really are good stories. In fact, the editor of this series, I, he's not a comic book fan, he's not into Hellraiser except, you know, we just watched them and he read just a couple of these and he's really intrigued. You don't really need to be a Hellraiser fan or even a comic book fan to get into this stuff and see why they're good. Neil Gaiman is perhaps best known for writing the groundbreaking dark fantasy comic series Sandman and Dave McKean for composing Sandman's iconic covers. 
Wordsworth is a great example of taking the basic tenets of the Hellraiser mythos, those being puzzle boxes that lead to hell, and abstracting it beyond the puzzle box. Wordsworth is about a librarian with an appreciation for crossword puzzles, though he believes there aren't any surprises left for him. That is, until a stranger on a train gives him a bizarre new crossword puzzle. Except this puzzle contains clues and answers that require Wordsworth to remember dark moments from his past and dark moments yet to come. The idea that the box is now a crossword puzzle is interesting, but it's the idea that not only are you trying to tease out the solution to the puzzle, but the puzzle also teases out your own dark desires leading to your damnation. The thing with Hellraiser is Cenobites never take anyone against their will, but they'll definitely help show you the way. At the end of the day, you get to hell all on your own. Dead Things Rot is about a serial killer compelled by the voices in his head to build a makeshift ramshackle body from the parts of different people. Except, the voice in his head is a soul damned to hell attempting to negotiate his freedom. The story is a great riff on the idea of the Cenobite as the evil genie and false god, never worth worshipping or dealing with because the house always wins. The story has more than one good plot twist, is beautifully drawn by Mike Mignola, the creator of Hellboy, and it's got a really good sense of humor to boot. For My Son is a perfect example of stories from the series that are Hellraiser in name only, with the exception of the last few pages. In this case, most of the story is devoted to the struggle of two illegal immigrants trying to stave off hunger in an apathetic city. Coming from an immigrant family himself, the writer infuses For My Son with so much pathos and the horror of day-to-day -day existence that you forget that there's this cathartic, vengeance-driven twist right around the corner. This story would be really great on its own even if it had no Hellraiser mythos attached. So horror video game fans went apeshit, me included, over the PT demo a veiled announcement for a new Silent Hill video game overseen by Guillermo del Toro and Hideo Kojima. In it, the player is inexplicably caught in a hallway that never ends, the door on one side only leading to the beginning, like an Ouroboros-inspired haunted house. My first thought when I heard about it was this story, like Flies to Wanton Boys, about a guy who just goes to put someone's coat away in a closet, only to end up in a nightmarish abyss, with only one door leading into another abyss. Except with every subsequent breach of the door, the next door gets further and further away, like a boat drifting away on the ocean surface. What does it have to do with Hellraiser? I have no idea, but it's scary stuff. What if Lon Chaney or Boris Karloff, the man of a thousand faces, had a sinister secret to their transformations? That's the great question answered in this beautifully drawn story set during the golden age of Hollywood. Desperate to wow audiences with his next role, a famed character actor is in search of a new look, but feels like he's taken makeup as far as it can go. It's practically Robert Downey Jr. from Tropic Thunder. I don't believe you people. What do you mean, you people? What do you mean, you people? Huh? I... But in this case, he ends up wearing other people's faces. Use your imagination as to how that happens. It's another story about obsession, of needing to achieve something no matter what the cost, which is where Hellraiser connections come in. The Tontine is about a group of World War II soldiers, jaded by the adrenaline of battle, who begin playing a deadly game of Russian roulette for a strange custom pistol bought in Italy. The game continues after they come home from the war, once a year, until whoever's left claims the prize. It's a suspenseful and incredibly tense story with enough interesting ambiguity to make you want to go back and take another look right after reading it. In fact, that's exactly what we did while we were recording this. We had the story right there in front of us and we're kind of asking each other questions. What's your take on this? What do you think this means? And we actually peeled back a few more layers than we had previously. Basically, it's really good. It's really interesting. And it's really good. These are just some of my personal favorite stories, but there are a bunch more. You're sure to find your own. There's a ton of other stuff to love, like the boxer, or the lady who wants to have children and gets more than she bargained for. They're not quite as epic as some of the ones we've discussed, but there's a lot to love. And yes, I know I said love twice. That's because I, that's how much I love it. I love it that much. And we really don't want to rewrite this stuff anymore, so we're just going to keep going. If you're still watching, then I guess that means I've got you at least a little bit hooked. You might be wondering how you go about reading all these gems. Well, you have some choices. You can always track down the original floppies published by Epic through various third parties on Amazon and eBay. That is simultaneously the most comprehensive and most pain in the ass way to go about it. Checkerboard Press had the rights to reprint the Epic stuff in trade form, and these are called Hellraiser, the Collected Best. There are three volumes and are definitely the most comprehensive collections. However, the rights to reprint the epic stuff have since gone to boom. So the checkerboard press trades are now out of print and could be hard to find. However, again, 
Devil's Due Publishing has digital versions of the Checkerboard Press Collections available for sale on iTunes. If you're determined to hold a collection in your hands and can't find the out-of-print Checkerboard Collections, fear not. Boom has actually reprinted two small trades worth of the epic stuff under the title Hellraiser Masterpieces, but they only have about half the stories that I consider to be the best. And there's some weird page ordering issues that don't quite match up between the different prints. Kind of confusing, isn't it? If you end up reading this stuff or already have, I highly recommend Tapping the Vein, which is comic book adaptations of some of Clive Barker's best short stories. Okay, don't forget, go listen to our stupid, dumb three-hour podcast on the Hellraiser movies. Again, if there's any cool series or things you'd like to see us cover, let us know. We're always open to suggestions. Comment, subscribe, Meerkat, Periscope, Tumblr, whatever you cool kids are doing these days, go out and do it as long as you share it. See you later.